And welcome to the Bright Side. Pharmacist Ben here. Thank you for joining us. 844-236-6010 is our number if you have questions or comments or love to hear how you're handling all this craziness, this uh, coronavirus craziness. How are you staying sane if you're in lockup? What are you doing nutritionally? What kind of supplements are you using? This is, uh, the well, it's always a good time to supplement, but there's no time better than the uh, present to get yourself on a good nutritional supplement program. The Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, Restart Your Life, Fucoid Z, and Ultimate Selenium are some of the fine immune-boosting products that you'll find on the longevity, in the Longevity lineup and on our Longevity website, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. And also, this is the time, if you've been thinking about it, if you've been on the bubble, if you haven't been thinking about it, if you, thought, if you never thought you'd want to get into a home-based business, this is the time to do it. People are going to, more and more, we're going to find people working out of the home. More and more people are going to want to be their own boss. More and more people are going to want to be in control of their financial future as well as their health future. And the longevity business opportunity allows you to leverage all of that. It allows you to have a home-based business. It allows you to help people and yourself and your family with health. It allows you to be financially free. Please call 866-735-2470. Tell them you want to join the Brightside Ben team or head to our websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or Critical Health News. Dot com for, uh, uh, for all the longevity products and to click on the join the team link as well for a one time $30 fee. You can be in business for yourself and have a longevity business and help spread the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program. Also want to remind you to check out our Truth Skin Health products at truthtreatments.com. We've got a perfect pair special. We've got a few specials going at truthtreatments.com. Never any preservatives, fragrances, fillers, waxes, emulsifiers, water, silicon oil, nothing your skin doesn't need or doesn't want in any of our Truth Skin Health products all formulated in my compounding pharmacy many years ago. All designed to heal the skin and of course as most of us listening to this program no, health is beauty and beauty is health. Beauty products should be health products, and I'm not a beauty professional, I'm a healthcare professional, and truth treatments are formulated as such. That's why I took all the baloney out and left just active and functional ingredients. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, we got Bob Fish. He's going to talk to us about boomers and millennials. Time for collaboration instead of combat. He's the author of a book called The Making of a Millennial Baby Boomer, and I've been fascinated with this subject for many years. I read a book called The Fourth Turning in the 1990s. If you like history, The Fourth Turning is an Awesome, awesome book. It's about something called generational theory, written by a guy named Neil Strauss. I believe his name is Neil Strauss, uh, and uh, it has a very. Uh, I'm sorry, Neil Howe and William Strauss are the authors of the book. It has a really interesting um, hypothesis, and that is that generations, which are about 20 to 25 years, repeat themselves. Every 20 or 25 years, you've got a high generation, then you've got an awakening generation, and then you've got an unraveling uh, generation, and then you've got a crisis generation. According to these authors, the high generation is also called the first. It's called the first turning, and it always occurs after a crisis. The high period, and if you want to go back to the most recent high period, it would be the period after World War II in the United States. During the high period, institutions are strong. It's more about uh, institutions than it is about individuals. Society is confident where it wants to go. It's feeling really good about itself, really good about itself. Just think of the generation, uh, post-war generation. Then the second period, the second turning, if you will, uh, is called the awakening turn, uh, awakening or second turning. And this is when institutions are attacked in the name of individualism. Think of the hippie generation, the uh, baby boomers, actually. The baby boomers represented the second Awakening, the uh, they call them the greatest generation, the the, the post war uh, post war generation. That was the high generation, the awakening generation, were the people who lived in the '60s. And then in the '80s, we had the unraveling. The unraveling is when uh, it's kind of like the opposite of a high. Institutions are weak. Institutions are distrusted. Individualism, think Reaganism, has started the this unraveling period. Started in the '80s, went to uh, beginning of the year 2000. Um, and uh, individualism is strong. Individual individualism thrives. Unravelings come after awakenings. So awakenings come after high and unravelings come after awakenings. Then the fourth turning, which we are in right now, is the crisis period. Can you relate? That's the fourth turning. This is an era of destruction, of chaos, of crisis, wars, revolution. Started around 2001. Think Homeland Security. Think 9-11. And uh, we're still in it. 
Um, the fourth, the last fourth turning was the Wall Street crash right before the awakening of World War I. And if you keep going back, uh, these, these two authors actually went back to the Middle Ages and they found these four periods. They found there was always a uh, high period, then an awakening period, then an unraveling period, and then a chaos period. And then they go back hundreds and hundreds of years. Give you a perfect, ex- uh, give you an example that we can relate to if you like history. Anyway, uh, the first, uh, going back to the Civil War period, we had uh, the Transcendentals. The Transcendentals were people who, uh, who uh, actually, the Transcendentals came after the Awakening. The Awakening was uh, the post-Revolutionary War period. The second generation, the second turning was the Transcendental generation. Then you had the Missionary generation. I guess that's kind of deep history. But m- most recently, we had the Baby Boomers and. Uh, uh, we had the post-war generation, the baby boomers, and then the post-Reagan or the Reagan period, and then the chaos period, which we are in now. Uh, and each generation, not surprisingly, has its own uh, personality types. The baby boomers were one type of personality. The millennials are another type of personality. Most recently, we had the Zoomers. And apparently, there is some kind of uh, hostility between the millennials and the baby boomers. There's a really interesting YouTube song, if you want to Google it. It's called OK Boomer. And OK Okay, boomer has become kind of a dismissive term for millennials to uh, talk about baby boomers, and you know maybe rightly so because baby boomers suffer from uh, who are in their 60s and 70s now, and 80s even suffer from old man's disease. Oh, I call old man's disease. You don't have to be a man to have it, by the way. I call what I call old man's disease is when you know how everything is, and of course younger generations don't. You know, they don't go for that. They don't want somebody telling them how everything is. And there's this hostility between the boomers and the millennials. Bob Fish is going to talk about that today at the bottom of the hour. His book is uh, The Making of a Millennial Baby Boomer, Time for Collaboration Instead of Combat. Anyway, the books, if you're interested in checking out The Fourth Turning, it's a really, really interesting book. you got to like history a little bit, but it is super, super cool. Um, fourth Turning. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. We'll get your calls in our next segment. And I wanted to talk about a very interesting hypothesis that I read about viruses and about something called extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles are little bubbles that come out of cells that are spit out of cells. And it turns out that these extracellular vesicles are ways that a cell purifies itself. I've always said that nail fungus, toenail fungus especially, or fingernail fungus, usually toenail on the toenails, is a way that the body eliminates fungus. Now, I haven't read this theory anywhere. It's just common sense, really, I mean, the way I think about it. And that's why you can't treat nail fungus uh, by putting something on the nail. In much the same way that the body purifies itself by eliminating fungus through the nail, cells purify themselves by eliminating toxins through something called vesicles. And as it turns out, there's an interesting relationship between viral particles and these vesicles, which we'll talk about when we come back from our break. On the bright side, I am pharmacist Ben. We've got Bob Fish coming up at the bottom of the hour. We'll talk a little bit about the generations. We'll talk about uh, the boomer generation versus the millennial generation. The OK Boomer, the concept of OK Boomer. OK Boomer, OK Millennial. This is, uh, I've been following this whole idea of generations for, since I read The Fourth Turning in the 90s, the idea that there are, history occurs in 80-period uh, segments made up of four 20-year uh, periods. So in the 19 post-war generation, the post after World War II, we had the baby boom generation, then we had Generation X, then we had Generation Y, then we had Generation Z. The first period is considered a high post-war generation. That was a real high for the United States. Uh, then we got into an uh, awakening period with a hippie generation, if you will. Then we got into uh, uh, um, the millennials. That was the unraveling. That was about individualism, the age of individualism versus the age of institutions or versus the glorification or deification of institutions. And now we're in the chaos period. If you want to go back one more turning or one more four turning, uh, you go back to 1860. This is how far this goes back 
all the way to the Middle Ages. But in 1860, we had, uh, from 1860s to the 1880s, we had what was called the Gilded Age. It was after the, after the Civil War. And much like after World War II, it was kind of a time of reconstruction. A lot of money was being spent. The Industrial Revolution was get, got going. A lot of, a lot of uh, industrialist wealth was born. The Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and all those people. This was 1860 to 1880. Then you had an awakening. And that was William Jennings Bryan. That was a, a questioning of things. That was 1880s to the 1900s. Then you had uh, the GI generation, and that was the Roaring Twenties. That is uh, similar to uh, that. That's called the. Uh, that would be considered the uh, the uh, awakening period. The Roaring Twenties. We don't care about the government. We're just going to go party. We're just going to go do things. And then later on, that turned into prohibition, and ultimately a crisis called the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, and even World War II. Then we went into the American High post World War II, etc. And this goes on back to the middle of the, uh, I think the 1400s. These guys track this whole four chunk, uh, these 80 year chunks in history that are made up of four periods, four 20 year periods. Anyway, boomers versus uh, millennials coming up at the bottom of the hour. We'll get your calls here in just a minute. I wanted to talk about this article that I read about extracellular vesicles. A vesicle is a bubble. Extracellular means outside the cell, a bubble that comes outside the cell. It turns out that there's a very close relationship between viral particles and extracellular vesicles, and there are some very esteemed minds who believe that uh, when we're testing for a virus, we're really testing for junk from the cell, that the cell is emitting out junk, emitting out toxicity. And what we call viruses, really just genetic material, is really just genetic waste that's being eliminated out of cells. Now, I'm not saying I know the answer, and I'm not saying this is true. I am just saying it's important to ask questions. This is the whole idea. This is what the bright side is about. This is what my personal life is all about, and this is what science should be all about, asking questions. Unfortunately, some, sometimes scientists become like everybody else, entrenched in their ideas. They believe their own BS. They have old man's disease. They get locked into an old way of being, an old way of thinking, we'll say, and they don't change. And so uh, when it comes to how viruses work and when it comes to uh, how we protect ourselves from viruses, the old the idea is you kill things. We, we come from a, a medical model that believes in killing things. We kill cancer. We kill bacteria. We kill viruses. We kill patients. How many, you know, here's a good question for us to ask. How many of those deaths that are being attributed to COVID are really are true? How do we know? Does anybody ever ask that question, that simple little question? How do we know? How, what kind of testing are they doing? How are we verifying these numbers, by the way? All the, and it's not the numbers aren't that big, but how are we verifying even those? How are we assessing whether somebody even has COVID? Or how are we assessing that their symptoms are related to the virus? I'm not saying I know the answer, by the way. I'm just saying these are questions we have to ask and be suspicious of any talking head on TV, whether that talking head is a medical professional, a government spokesman, or, worst of all, somebody who represents the media. The media coming from the word middle, by the way. Media is somebody who sticks themselves between what's really happening and what you hear. Uh, The media government spokespeople, medical professionals, be very, very, very suspicious if they're quoting numbers and statistics, or at least ask questions. Do you notice how we're always hearing how many people are infected? Who the hell cares how many people are infected? What's the point of that? And all the numbers that they're running, how many millions of people and hundreds of thousands of people are going to die and thousands of people a day are going to die, that's all based on modeling. That's all based on statistical algorithms. They put a number in and they see what comes out. Well, guess what? The number you put in is going to have is going to be the direct cause of the number that comes out. So if the number, the number that is going into the black box of statistics and algorithms, if it's wrong, you're going to be your conclusion is going to be wrong. So don't you think we should ask how are those numbers getting fed into the algorithm system? These are just questions to ask. It's what a good scientist asks. It's not what a doctor. Uh, it's not what a medical professional necessarily asks. There are some medical professionals who ask, but the ones who are just spouting off st- statistics and giving you the party line, as well as the media and the government spokespeople. If they're repeating something they heard and they're not giving you something that's got biochemical logic or makes sense in any way, shape, or form from a biological perspective, don't pay attention. And by the way, don't watch the news anyway. What are those masks going to do? You think the virus can't get through a mask? 
if it indeed is really that kind of thing, a viral infection that's spread through the air, which, you know, we don't know yet. All right. 844 Ask questions. Don't believe things just because you're told. Ask questions. I was just reading a really interesting quote here. See if I can find it. This is Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays is known as the uh, father of public relations. And he had a really interesting quote here that I'm just going to read, and then we'll get your phone calls. Uh, if I could find it. All right, I can't find it now. I'll see if I can. We'll get to Robert in Nevada. I'll see if I can pull this out. Robert, what's going on, buddy? Well, I've got a question. Yes, sir. So let's wrap up uh, viruses and then. Uh, oh, yeah, we were talking about viruses. Here's the quote, by the way. The conscious, this is Edward Bernays. Let me do this real quick. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a de- democratic society. This is a direct quote from his book, Propaganda, by the way. Those who manipulate this unseen machinery of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of the country, unquote. And that's yeah. from Edward yeah. Bernays. And I don't want to go off conspiratorial, but just ask questions. Who benefits? Follow the money, etc. All right, Robert, go ahead. So uh, uh, we talked about viruses and how they uh, get into your body, they get inside the cell, make copies to manipulate themselves, etc., etc. So I guess my, I have two questions actually. First, what's the ignition switch on a virus? How does it start or is it just... Well, the theory is the theory is is that certain viruses and genetic material have, this is the theory, have a genetic predisposition for specific cells, types. So we have 200 different cells in the body. Eat, this is the theory. Each one of those cells, or virus, has a specific predilection for one or the other of the cells. That's why the coronavirus, for example, only affects your respiratory system. It doesn't affect your neurology. The herpes virus affects your neurology. It doesn't, it doesn't affect your respiratory system. So each, the theory is each virus has, is specific for certain cell types. Um, okay. There's so much more to talk about viruses. I hope I answered that question. Uh, and I've left a couple people on hold here. We'll see. I'll see if I can get you in uh, before we talk to Bob Fish at the bottom of the hour. On the bright side, I am Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific, 10 to 11 Central, and 24-7 on the archive page at brightsideben.com. You'll find longevity products and blog posts and news stories and lots of good videos and lots and lots of free health information on, on all our websites, criticalhealthnews.com, pharmacistben.com, and brightsideben.com. And don't forget about our true skin health products at truthtreatments.com and supplements and herbal formulas at Truth nourishment.com. I am very happy to have our next guest on. Some, he's a specialist, I guess you'd say, uh, in uh, something that we talk about a lot on this program and I talk a lot about. I just am very fascinated with the idea of generations and how every generation has certain characteristics and qualities. And I was, I was always interests me to see how the, what, what's going on in, in the historical period, in the time, time we live in, and how that relates to how people form their mindsets generationally. Uh, most of you guys know know now about boomers and millennials and gen x and bob fish the author of the making of a millennial baby boomer calls himself a millennial baby boomer and i can't wait to hear about why he does that uh he has a concept or a idea of collaborating instead of combating and i think that's always a good idea um i guess you've heard of okay boomer right bob fish oh absolutely ben great to be on your show Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. Have you seen the YouTube video, the song, OK Boomer? It's quite funny. Yes, and, and <laughs> actually, um, you know, I did a blog with Forbes about OK Boomer, OK Millennial, because there's T-shirts made of OK Boomer saying, have a terrible day. And so I had, like, T-shirts made of OK Millennial. <laughs> and have a great it's really day. really not to have a terrible day is what we're yeah. going to discuss. It's all about mutual mentoring and how I came across and how to go after that. Do you have kids yourself? 
No, I don't. But, uh, you know, the reason I wrote this book has a lot to do with my background is that uh, I uh, was in retailing for 40 years and I uh, founded and I ran a company a CEO called RU21, R-U-E-21. And I had 20,000 employees where 90% of them were under 35. And in the home office, out of the 400, 300 were 20 to 30. And I taught them business. They taught me life. And we built Rue to being the largest specialty of power retailer in America in StoreCal and, and you, with you, young people. So uh, that's why I have a great belief of, of millennials and the mutual mentoring working with them. So these were young millennials at the time when when you were doing Route 21. People were just starting their starting off in their adult adult years, I would imagine. Correct. Well, I would say, well, um, well, you know, it, it's millennials are really, and it, 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 and everybody has different dates, but it's, you know, 1981 born to 1996. You have to remember, you you know, it's like I was a baby boomer at 25. You know, we all were 25 yeah, that's years true. old once. And, that's true. and so, but it, you still still have those traits. And what I believe in is, is that it, it's not what you are, it's who you are, and it's your lifestyle. And, you know, I, I have the registry and intellectual property from millennialbabyboomer.com and, and, and I own it and, I, and it's good for my book and also for my building of my brand. So you, you don't want to label people based on, you don't want to pre-label them or prejudge them or put them in a category. Nonetheless, in the big picture or the macro sense, stereotyping in this way can allow you to make certain shortcuts, mental shortcuts, as long as you know you're doing them. You don't want to put everybody in specific spe- specific baskets. and Everybody has their individual traits. But that's not to say that this is not a useful way of looking at, looking at uh, how people interact in a macro sense. So what is the problem? between millennials and boomers. Well, first of all, to what you're saying is, no, you don't want to stereotype people, but that's why, uh, you know, I might be calling myself the first millennial baby boomer, but many people can be, and, and certainly uh, Generation X, which sometimes is the, uh, the, the, the the generation that no one talks about, but there's yeah. a lot to talk about, you know. So, so, so you know, to me, why? Um, I, I think that, you know, it's like anything else. It's like when we were younger, you know, whether you're a Generation X and I'm a, a, a chronological boomer, we all at 25 wanted to be recognized, to be acknowledged, to, to be heard. And I think that's what happens now, and it's just different. And what I see is that, and very relevant to now, is the millennial um, looks at the baby boomer and, like, oh, my God, they're going to help stop me from getting ahead because they're in their jobs for a long time. That's not really true. You know, in running Rue um, and building a huge business of a corporate billion-dollar business, um, you know, I, you know, I, I – who promoted people or built people that were the best in their jobs. And I think millennials have to understand it. What they have to understand also is to handle the tough time counseling of, of boomers or Generation X. And because yeah. they, need, they, need, they have great vision and creativity, but sometimes they need to take that vision to fruition with the help of the older people. You said something really interesting. You know, when I was 25, I looked at the generation ahead of me the same way. I, it's like every generation looks at the older generations like they're old. That's right. Right? It's like a That's natural right. – te- I'm sure it's gone on, you know, from ta- since the beginning of history. The generations always look at the older generations as kind of having old ideas. But the Generation Xers have a point here in the sense that our world is in a big mess because of a lot of baby boomer ideas and baby boomer uh, philosophies or concepts about business, about, corp- you know, the corporations and the trashing of the oceans and, and, and environment. Mental toxicity certainly didn't start with the baby boomers, but it got accelerated with that generation, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I agree. And sometimes what the millennials get upset about is they want to see the baby boomers start to open up more and not be overbearing, self-appointed lecturers of this is how life is. When I put my book together with Forbes Books, I worked with Adam Witte, who's president and CEO of Forbes Books, and, and Steve Forbes, and they felt there was a great uh, white, you know, white space opportunity because you know people need to really look at this mutual mentoring. It's not 
just the boomer telling the millennial what to do. The millennial tells the boomer what to do. Mm -hmm. And there, and I could give you facts and figures of companies that have gone through that with having reverse mentoring on millennials that have really helped. And I think with what's going on with COVID-19 is I think more than ever we're going to need to listen to some younger people in how to help guide us. And we have to be there as the tough time council leader to mentor and to coach them. How have you dealt personally with going into being a baby boomer who is like the cool kid, the cool kid kind of thing, you know, to being the baby boomer who's now like the older generation? Well, but first of all, I don't look at things older generations or things like that. If if you don't know me, but 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 to me, in running a big business, I ran. Believe it or not, I was able to run it as a family and a corporation business. Look, I took this company and we we formatted it and and built it and then took it private and then and then I actually took it into bankruptcy first because it needed it and then we never missed an estimate for 11 straight years and then I took it public and then I sold the business in 2013 for over a billion dollars back to the equity guys. And so, you know, but to me, you know, I always looked at things as that, you know, that I didn't look at myself as an age or a stereotype. People didn't look at me. Look, I'd love to shoot the you-know-what in the bullpen with the merchants and the marketing teams more sometimes than the investors and the private equity and the analysts. So, well, so, hang on, Bob. we gotta take, we got to take a break. I I definitely want to hear about Millennial Boomer, though. So we'll talk about that when we come back. I'm Farm Suspend. You're listening to The Bright Side. We'll be back right after this. Okay, we're back on The Bright Side talking to Bob Fish, author of The Making of a Millennial Baby Boomer and... Uh, the founder, I guess, of Rue 21. I, I didn't know that about you, Bob. That's pretty impressive. Sold for a billion dollars. So I guess I should be listening because you, you must know a thing <laughs> or two. You must know a thing or two. What is a millennial baby? What is a millennial baby boomer? Well, a millennial baby boomer, the way I look at it, is somebody, as I've been mentioning, that is, you know, is has a has a you know not just stuck into one generation that they have attitudes and feelings and lifestyle that could be different ones just like you mentioned when you were younger in 25 the older generation you looked at them a certain way but you have you you have certain traits of both and mm. i formed a millennial advisory board team uh not only just to write the book but to also building of my brand which has a group of people you know who i'm very friendly with 25 to 35 years old and then some generations X and some boomers to really help me in, you know, because I think that's the whole thing. is It's really leadership, mentoring, and I call it weaponizing listening. And, and I think to a millennial baby boomer is so, is just is somebody that understands and understands the, the respect of mutual mentoring, Ben. I, I love how you say reverse mentoring, or now you say mutual mentoring, because we can be mentored from both directions. It's not like you're yeah, older, so you mentor. The younger can mentor the older just as well as the older can, can uh, mentor the younger. I mean, it goes both ways. Yeah, I, you know, reverse mentoring. So, for example, you know, I could not have built this business without having a great group of millennials working with me. Mm -hmm. And it's it was my attitude how to handle things in that. And, and, you know, to me, it wasn't to be stuffy. And it's no different than when I speak to places like whether it's FIT in New York or whatever. You have to come across like I had, you know, that I'm just full of myself because I'm a leader and I'm older and stuff like that. That's not it. You know, you know, everything, as you mentioned, when we went back on the program, uh, the reason that I did well and the reason that I give back now to help people achieve things further than they ever thought they could go is, is because it's not theory. It's all about practice of things that I did in my career that I did things that most people never did. Many people didn't take companies that and private that into bankruptcy, back to private, back to public, back to private, and, and, and to do things like that. And so to do that, it's all about people and it's leadership. And so, so you have to me, your... you know, and that's, that's the, the mutual mentoring. And one thing to add in reverse mentoring, um, 
a perfect example is the Estee Lauder guy, uh, Fabrizio Frida, who took a business from $7 billion to almost $70 billion in 10 years. He formed a program of young millennials working with his top senior executives to come up with new ideas, new companies, new thoughts. And that's great. And I think that we have to think that way. Okay, so you have your foot in both worlds, the millennial world and the baby boomer, baby boomer world. Give me some, what, what stands out to you as qualities in the baby boomer, or in the millennial world, and then in baby boomer world, and then how can they, how can you, the two get together? It's three questions. Sure. The baby, what stands out for millennials? What stands yeah. out for baby boomers? How can they get together? Yes. And so in millennials, first of all, you know, they have such a great understanding of technology and right now even more important and is social media, which the, the baby boomers don't understand as much. And you need their help. I mean, going through this whole thing with COVID-19 right now is what's going on and the, and the millennials on social media pushing for donations and working with hospitals and, and different restaurants and, 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 you know, they're really giving back and figured out how to do that, which I think is very important. And so that's part of it. They also push and teach me and hopefully you and other people to get out of your comfort zones. Because to me, the reason that I'm respected has nothing to do with my age. Hey, look, I, could, I run five miles a day. Okay, and I can run ten minute mile. I can run a six minute mile. Okay, I couldn't do that thirty years ago. My head is very different. My attitude is different, and a lot of it is because I'm hanging around with millennials in, in between my work and 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 a personal life. As far as a baby boomer, they help the millennial take their vision and creativity to fruition. It's I call it tough time counseling, Ben. That that you need to be there to coach and mentor them and to really get them to listen. A lot of millennials don't want to listen. A lot of millennials think you don't have to make a profit to do well in business. That's certainly going to change now going forward in life. Is there so a diff- I think those are important. Is there a difference between older millennials and younger millennials that you've noticed? <laughs> um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And, some, you know, um, yeah, I, I think that they have a little more maturity, an older one of being through some things in life, but they've never gone through what they're going through now in life, and that's where you need the older person, the, the generation next to baby boomer, to help them get through this. They're all freaked out about what goes on. So I, I think that there are different aspects, and that's why you can't just stereotype people. Hey, look, Ben, a key thing. The millennial of today, who's 25 to 30, most likely in the average will live to 100 years old. The person born today will probably live to 110. They're going to be working for 70, 80 years mm. in, in business. And they right now, the big issue with millennials is that they all expect that they got to be multimillionaires by 25 or 30 or they're not successful. they got to calm down. they got to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And, and that's where the older person has to help. The, the, the boomer has to help them on that and say, hey, calm down a little on that. You don't have to try to be successful so quickly. You need to learn the lessons of life. That's something that I find that you really, if you care about what's the future of millennials taking over in business and life, you got to work with them. So in, in terms of the last couple of minutes here, in terms of action steps, if you have a, a situation at work or, you know what, in a situation of family also, because there's, there's a millennial and boomer dynamics within families, how can the two get together succinctly? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's just, I think it's, I think the leadership has to start from the Generation X or the boomer to, to show people, the millennial, that they're smart and understand them. They're not trying to not have them be in their jobs or enjoy their life with their family, but that you're trying to point out things from your experience and then listen, listening. Mm. This is not listening. Weaponizing listening, I call it, is not just what millennials don't do. It's not what boomers and other generations. It's all across the generations. And you always wanted, when you were younger, somebody to listen to you. Mm. So I think that's important, Ben. And, and hey, look, my philosophy is the best is yet to come for both the millennial 
and the boomers. And that, so that's a whole other subject about for boomers' life and going forward. But for millennials, is to take time, and but we need to we need to learn from them, and 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 they we need and they gain respect by us listening and being smart at what we do to help them and to guide you, them, and then hopefully they listen. Some do, you, some don't. You know, the ones that are going to do really well will end up listening. But you got, I think you have to go out of your way with them. That's real quick, belief. real quick, Bob. Have you noticed a difference in how the baby boomers versus the millennials are handling this whole all the stuff stuff that's going on today? The I see, stuff. Yeah, I see some of the boomers worrying about the stock market and their wealth. That what's going to happen to me? And I see the millennials are sitting there a little freaked out, but they're also being more into what I call work life integration of trying to. And right now it's quarantine life integration of of trying to take care of things and and sometimes those influences are really important in that. So, so I, you know, I, I see that, you know, that's where they got to both try to work together so the best is yet to come, and it will happen. Look, one big thing on this. It's not going to end in a couple of weeks, Ben. This is gone, it's going to go on for months, no matter where you live and what's going on, some areas more than other. We have to understand that and not feel like, my God, what's happening to us living at home? We need to take these couple of months and really understand the values and be authentic. Mm. and to take leadership in family and business. I love that. Thank you so much. That's Bob Fish, uh, author of The Making of a Millennial ba- Baby Boomer. That was very informative and educational. Thank you so much, Bob. Appreciate it. Well, you have a website real quick? Ben, enjoyed the questions. Enjoyed hey, the talk. Hey, do, you have a, do you have a website, Bob, you want to give out? Yes. Yes. It's mo- yes. My website is millennialbabyboomer.com. Com, and that's where you can buy books and Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Target and all that. My book, and go to Fishtails, F I S C H T A L E S one, uh, which is my uh, Instagram because there's a lot of good stuff in there too. So I Thank appreciate you. being on your show. Thank you so much, Bob. Take care, buddy. Be well. All right, as Bob Fish, author of The Making of a Millennial Baby Boomer, and that is all the time we have for today on the Bright Side. Thanks for listening. Our website's BrightSideBen.com, PharmacistBen.com and criticalhealthnews.com for all of the longevity products and truthtreatments.com for our truth skin health products and truthnourishment.com for our supplements as well as uh, herbal formulas. Thanks for listening to The Bright Side. Have yourselves a wonderful, beautiful, awesome, spectacular day. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll talk to you all later. Bye for now.